What's the story with Escape from Tarkov? Unfortunately for me, this is a game that I'm very familiar with, having played probably 10,000 plus hours of it over the last seven years over on my Twitch channel, which is also the reason why I had gray hair when I was 25 years old. But for those of you that don't know what Escape from Tarkov is, let's break it down. So Escape from Tarkov is a first person shooter created by the Russian developers Battlestate Games. It is notoriously difficult and is pretty widely regarded as probably the most hardcore first person shooter of all time. Some of the things this game has garnered insane notoriety for over the last couple of years is one, insane weapon customization. I mean, you can modify a weapon however you want. It is the most in-depth and complicated and most convoluted weapon modification system in any video game. Number two, intense firefights between not only other real people, but also the AI in the game, which we will cover a little bit later on. Number three, probably my favorite part of the game is the immersive and beautiful level design across all of the different maps. And number four, giving all of its players the intense urge to shove a flathead screwdriver in their eye after prolonged periods of playing. So let's get to the general premise of the game. You've got two different characters. You have your PMC and you also have your SCAV. We're going to cover the PMC first because this is where most players are going to spend most of their time playing the game. Your PMC stands for Private Military Contractor. You can play as either a USEC or you can play as a bear, one being Russian, one being American. Now there's three main things that you will want to do on your PMC. One, you will want to quest. Number two, you will want to upgrade your hideout. And number three, you will want to make money. So what is questing in a first person shooter look like? Fair question. In Tarkov, you've got multiple different traders. You use these traders throughout the entire game to buy things like ammunition, armor, weapons, modifications for your weapons, on top of tons of other different items. Every trader kind of has their own unique pool of items. Now, not only do they have unique items, but they also have unique quests and quest lines. Each and every different trader will have different tasks for you, and they all fall into these categories. Number one, go here, kill this thing. There's another variety of this quest called go here, kill this thing with this. Other types of quests include fetch quests, go here, get this, generally revolving around having a key for a certain area. So you have to open up a door with a really expensive key, grab a quest item and leave the raid and survive with that certain quest item. I know what you're saying. That sounds pretty simple. It's not. It's actually incredibly difficult and a lot of people give up when they get to these certain quests because they'll get stuck somewhere because they can't survive a certain raid or certain map and escape with the item that they need. And then the third type of quest you have is going to be go here and mark this or go here and jam this signal or go here and set up a Wi-Fi camera. Very fun. And then when you get very, very far into the game and you unlock this other guy called Lightkeeper, yes, I know it keeps getting deeper and we've barely even started. But once you get to Lightkeeper, he will give you tasks where not only do you have to survive a certain raid, but you're going to have to go to one map grab this item, go to another map, plant this here, and then go back to the map that Lightkeeper is on and give him back that item. So that can be like three, four raids in a row that you must survive in order to complete these quests. At this point, you might be starting to understand why I have gray hair. So that's kind of the quest covered in a very, very simple way. Trust me, the questing system is very deep and there's a lot of other things you do have to do. But just for the sake of not having this video be two hours long, we're not going to cover every single quest type. But those three that I have given you, pretty much define a lot of the stuff that you're going to be doing until you hit max level. Max level being level 42, which is considered to most people being max level, but it can go much further beyond that. The reason why we say level 42 is max level is because when you hit 42, that is when you get the final max level trader unlocked. So you have access to all of the gear from the traders. That's quest covered. Let's talk about the hideout real quick. The hideout was a new addition to the game a couple of years ago, and it's actually really, really cool. Now you click into the hideout and this is basically your PMC's little home. So there is tons of different things you can do in here. One being crafting items that come with found and raid tags, which are very important because certain quests require you to have survived with the item that you found in a raid in order to hand it in to get a reward. Crafting items in the hideout actually gives you found and raid stuff. So it's very useful to spend your time and money upgrading this stuff. You can buy things from the flea market, which is another thing we're going to get into in order to upgrade your hideout. So what can you do in your hideout? Well, one, you can craft weapons, you can craft ammunition, you can craft tons of other items that are required for quests, barters, all that wonderful stuff. Not only can you craft in here, but you can also get passive buffs for your character. One very important buff being from the air filtration system, which allows you to level your physical skills faster. And yes, there is MMO style skills in Tarkov. 
Yes, we are still going deeper. You've got that. You've got the library, which upgrades your other skills even faster as well. And then you have like the water filtration system that you can put water into to get bottles of purified water, which you can then use in your alcohol creator to make bottles of moonshine, which you can then sell on the flea market for money, or you can trade them for a really nice set of night vision goggles. Jesus Christ, it just doesn't end. And then, if you thought all of that wasn't enough, you've also got a nutrition station, where kitchen basically, where you can craft a bunch of different food items, which you can eat, or you can also make them for quests, because some quests do require some food items. Then you have the Bitcoin farm. Yes, we're still going. You can actually build a Bitcoin farm in Escape from Tarkov in your hideout, and you can fill it with graphics cards in order to make Bitcoins, which you can then barter for weapons cases, and you can also sell them to the traders for a lot of money. Bitcoins are very valuable in Escape from Tarkov, which is cool because the in-game price of Bitcoins corresponds to the real-life price of Bitcoins. So there's actually a system there that keeps track of the price and then the prices of Bitcoins go up and down day by day. It's pretty cool. Then you also have the Intelligence Center. When you upgrade your Intelligence Center, it lets you craft really high end tech items, which you will need later on down the line to hand in for your late game quests. Not only that, but the Intelligence Center also awards you extra money for completing quests and it also lowers the cooldown of your scav which is pretty neat. One of the coolest things in your hideout, which I, I think is at least one of the coolest things in your hideout, you've got the gun range. So the gun range used to be a very simple thing where you would just walk up to it, you'd press a button, you'd pull out your gun and then you could shoot at targets and you could see how the recoil felt and you could mess around with certain builds and see, oh, this feels nice. Oh, I don't like that scope. Oh, I like this attachment. And then you can build your dream gun by testing it in the hideout and you can see what you like and what you don't. They've added new upgrades to the shooting range in the hideout, which allow you to have more targets. And not only that, you can control. So like targets will move. They also have little pop-up targets, so they'll be up like this. You shoot them, they go bink, and then they come back up after a certain period of time. On top of that, you also have the gym in the hideout. So with the gym, you can go in and you can exercise. You can bench press with your PMC, and if you screw it up, you break your arms, and then you've got to buy an item to fix your arms. There's all kinds of medical items you need to use if you do this. But it also awards you experience in your strength and endurance, and I think also your health skill. I could be wrong about that. And then the newest addition to the hideout is the trophy room. This is pretty cool because you can take rare valuable items and you can display them in your hideout. So if you're really rich and you just kind of want to pimp out your hideout, you can just put like a collection of the new Funko Pop items they just added to the game. Or you can get dog tags, which must be found in raid. You get dog tags from killing other players, looting them, grabbing them from their dog tag slot and then extracting from the raid with them. If you do this and you add a bunch of found in raid dog tags of the opposing faction to yours, you actually get combat XP boosts. So that's pretty much everything in the hideout covered. And now we're going to talk about making money because as everybody knows, making money in Tarkov is probably the most important aspect of the entire game. So how does one make money in Escape from Tarkov? Well, there's a few very, very simple ways this can be done. One, you go in on your PMC, you go to a map that is generally known for having decent loot with a decent value that you can sell on the flea market. Now, what is the flea market? The flea market is a player run auction house in Escape from Tarkov, where if I go and I find a morphine injector, say I don't need morphine injectors, I've got too many and I've got very little money and I want to sell this on the flea market, I can right click it, sell it on the flea market, enter the price that I want to sell it at, press post, and that will end up on the list with all of the other people selling morphines. It's a very, very simple system, but it's a great way to make a lot of money because if I was to go and sell a morphine injector to a trader, I would get much less money from the trader than I would if I took the extra effort and sold it on the flea market. This is where a majority of most people's money will come from. So the first category of items that you're gonna to wanna to be looking for on your PMC or your scav runs are rare loot items. Now, these are some of the most valuable items in the entire game, and they include the ever elusive Bitcoin, which will sell for about half a million rubles, which to put into perspective is like two or three really decked out, really modded, really nice guns. Like that's a lot of money for a single slot item that you can put in your secure container. By the way, the secure container is a special item that you can put items into during a raid. Whereas if you die, you don't actually lose those items. You get to keep them forever. So people keep their keys in their secure container. They keep expensive medical items in their container. They also keep injectors cases in their container so that they can fill them with useful stimulants that will help you during combat. Other rare loot items include lion statues. You got cat statues. You got horse statues. You've got the entire new set of Funko Pop style figurines in the game now, 
We also have pro kill medallions, we've got gold chains, you've got chainlets, you've got just the list goes on. There is a lot of different rare and expensive valuable loot items in the game. Other items also include hideout items. Now, these you are going to want to sell on the flea market if you don't need them yourself. Hideout items in the early game are some of the most expensive items in the game. So hideout items are absolutely huge for making money. Other very valuable items that you're going to want to find are medical supply items. So for one, you have the lead X, which is the grand and daddy of all items that you can find in Tarkov other than colored key cards. And then you have your classic weapon attachments, rare weapons, especially weapon attachments that are required for the gunsmith quest line. The gunsmith quest line is a quest line for mechanic where he wants you to make a certain gun a certain way. So he will want you to have X amount of ergonomics, X amount of recoil, because you can see all these stats in game. And then sometimes he will tell you, hey, I want this suppressor. I want this handguard. I want this buttstock. I want this pistol grip. I want this foregrip. I want this tactical device, this optic. You get the idea. It gets a little bit complicated, but these items are generally kind of hard to find. So when people do find them and they already have the task completed, they will take those items and sell them on the flea market for half a million rubles because they're a bunch of scamming bastards. And then other less expensive items, but things you're going to want to pick up while you're in a raid, food and hydration items. So these will basically keep your PMC topped up on food and hydration, because for whatever reason, your PMC has the most insanely accelerated metabolism of any human being on planet Earth. And when you're in a raid for 30 minutes, if you don't feed and water your PMC, he will start humming and hawing, he will start coughing, and he won't be able to run anymore. Because when you run out of food and hydration, not only does your character just take passive damage, but also your stamina regeneration generates really, really slowly. So not only do you have to keep your PMC healed in rage, you know, if you get shot, you got to fix something, you got to bring splints, you've got to bring items that heal your limbs, you've got to bring stuff that stop bleeds, you've got to fix items that can fix blacked out limbs, such as your surgery kit, but also you have to worry about keeping your PMC fed and happy. And last but not least, you're going to want to be keeping your eyes peeled for ammunition boxes on the maps. Ammo is obviously very, very important. Some ammo is a lot better than others, and some ammo you can actively sell, but generally my advice to most people is you should probably keep most of the ammo that you find unless it is complete crap. In which case you can either leave it there or take it out of the raid and sell it. So now that we've gone over the things that you are typically going to be doing in the game, we are going to start talking about character customization. Now this gets very deep. I've already talked about how you can customize your weapons pretty much any which way that you want, which is pretty sweet. So you can have whatever gun that you want and put whatever stupid looking crap on it that you want because God knows people do that. But you can also customize your tactics rig, which is generally used for holding your medication and your magazines and grenades. You can also customize your pockets. Inside in your pockets, you can have grenades, medical items, ammunition, whatever you like. And then you can also bring different size backpacks with you. So depending on what you want to do in your raid, you can bring a bigger bag if you're going to loot. Or if you want to try and stay low profile, you can bring a much smaller backpack if you don't plan on fighting people or looting anything. You also have your body armor. You also have your helmets. You also have your contacts, which are headphones that allow you to hear more clearly within the game. Then you also have cosmetics such as your glasses. You can also wear different hats. You can wear things that cover your face, such as balaclavas and shamogs and all that other kind of good stuff. So the character customization in the game goes pretty hard. And it's pretty cool to kind of pimp out your character. You can also go to one of the traders, Ragman, and he has a whole host of different clothing that your character can wear. So you can make him look all tactical or Maybe if you're going to a woody map, you can change your clothes to green and you can blend in. So it's pretty sweet. So the next thing we're going to be talking about is the different categories of runs that you're going to be doing with your main character. The first one being budget runs. Then we move on to hatchet runs. And then you also have geared runs. So let's break down the first one first. So generally, budget runs are used by people who maybe are progressing a little bit slower than other players and you only have access to kind of basic stuff, but you still want to run the game and still stay somewhat competitive with the other people who have progressed ahead of you. Because there is actually a lot of weapons that you can buy for very cheap in this game that you can use to drop heavily geared players. Budget runners will typically wear very cheap armor, probably no helmet, maybe just like a balaclava or something just for some style points. And then they'll run something like a bolt action sniper rifle with an ammo type that can defeat a certain level of armor. Generally, if your bullets can kill through like a class four armor, you can shoot them in the head once or you can shoot them in the chest two or three times and they will die. Other guns that fall into the budget category are shotguns, which are absolutely devastating in this game, especially if you shoot people in the legs, they will fall over incredibly quickly. And then there are also many budget SMGs that you can use in the game, along with certain budget assault rifles. But I would say for budget weapons, bolt action rifles and shotguns are generally the way a lot of players go. Next up, we have hatchet runners. Now, hatchet runners have 
incredibly small penises. These are people that go into your raid with the sole purpose of sprinting straight towards all of the high loot spots, picking up those items and then putting them in their secure container and then just disconnecting from the raid so that they can leave with those items. Hatchet runners have absolutely zero positive impact on the game and all they do, they run in and they ruin the raid for other players. Now, you might be wondering, what's a hatchet runner? Well, a hatchet runner is a player who runs into a raid completely naked with absolutely zero money spent on their loadout. They just go with a free secure container, completely devoid of all items, and they just run and they gobble, 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 and then leave. They're bastards, okay? That's all you need to know about those people. And then next up, you have geared runs, right? So little Timmy has made a come up. He's found a Ledex, he's found a couple of Bitcoins, and he's like, damn, I've got like two or three million rubles. Let's really, you know, throw some shit at the wall here and see what sticks. So we're gonna put on all of our best gear. We're gonna get our most best meta weapon, best ammo, best optic. And then Timmy's gonna venture into his first raid incredibly geared and die to an AI with one bullet right here, head eyes. That's generally the experience for a lot of people when they come in and they do their very first geared raid and they bring in a lot of really nice stuff. You're just going to die to an AI. But it's also a learning moment because welcome to Tarkov and this is just how your life is going to be when you're playing this game. It'll be filled with frustration, misery, depression, and every now and again, a really nice come up, which balances everything else out, which keeps you pushing further and further so you can achieve that come up once again. So now that we've talked about what you do on your PMC, let's get into what you do on your scav. So your scav is a, another character that you can play completely for free. You get a predetermined loadout on your scav that's generally some pretty low level stuff. The nice thing about it is it's completely free. You can do these pretty much every 15 to 20 minutes. So if you have a really bad raid on your PMC and you die, you can go and do your scav run, you can go around the map and you can loot some things and you can make some some of your money back. It's a really nice system. It's really fun. So the way scav runs work is you click your scav and then you choose which map that you would like to go to. You will be loaded in generally anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes into the raid. Which brings us on to our next subject, the different types of scavs. These are the types of players that will go into a raid. You won't even know they're there because if they hear anybody, they will sit in a corner for 10 minutes, wait until the coast is completely clear, then they will come out, they will loot, they will loot, they will loot, they will loot, and they will leave. You won't even know they're there. They'll be gone and so will all of the loot. This is kind of how I play my scav. It's pretty fun to just kind of ninja around, just kind of grab stuff under the noses of other people. It's a pretty good time. Now, the second type of scav player is what I would consider to be a griefer. You are an absolute bastard if you do this on your scav runs. You know exactly who you are. If you're watching this, you should feel bad about yourself. But what these players do is they will go to a certain map which has multiple very high loot spawn locations on it. And what they'll do is they will run directly there and then they will lie in wait in a dark corner to ambush players and other scavs that have come through these locations in order to steal the things that they have picked up. You're a bastard and I hate you. You make a lot of people not want to play the game and you should feel terrible about yourself. Now, the third type of scav player in Escape from Tarkov, which I also kind of fall into this category as well. You load into a scav raid, the very first bullet that you hear, you sprint directly towards it with absolutely zero interest in surviving the raid because there's a slight chance that you might just kill a squad and get a bunch of gear and a massive come up. So now we're going to talk about all of the different maps within Escape from Tarkov, of which there are 10. Most maps include a unique boss, which we are also going to talk about. First map on that list is Factory, also known as the meat grinder of the game. Because when you load into Factory, the odds are you will move your character for about three seconds and you will run into another player. Now, there's another thing that can happen when you go into Factory. You might not be greeted by another player, but you might be greeted by the map's boss, Tagilla. Now, if you thought the regular AI in this game was scary and other players were scary, Tagilla is going to scare the shit out of you. Tagilla is a madman wielding a hammer who will sprint at you and beat you to death with a sledgehammer. Let that sink in. Yes, he will run at you with a sledgehammer. Not only that, but he is wearing very high tier armor and he is pretty hard to kill until you get some end game gear. Next up, we're going to talk about the map that most of you, if you're a new player, are going to end up playing a lot, which is Customs, which is generally known as kind of the noob map of Escape from Tarkov. Customs is very simple. It's a big, long, basically straight line with two different sides. You've got the wooded side with dorms, and then on the other side, you have the factory location with spots such as Fortress, you've got construction, you've got new construction, and then the big sprawling factory zone. Now, the boss of the customs area is known as Rishala. Rishala is a little bit different to Tagila because not only is it him, but you also have his entourage of goons who will fuck you up 
equally as much as the boss will. Now, Rishala comes with some fairly decent gear for the early game, just generally stock AKs and AKMs, sometimes some good ammo. And if you get really lucky, some of his goons can have really good armor for you, including Alton helmets with visors, which is widely considered to be the best helmet in the entire game because it provides coverage for your entire face and it's high level, so most ammo types will bounce off it, making you quite tanky. Moving on from that, we move to Woods, which is another map which has a lot of early game quests where the boss of this map is a fella called Sturman. Now, Sturman is a bastard. And the reason why Sturman is a bastard is because he has a weapon called an SVD, which shoots 762 by 54 r ammo, which is known as like, you know, the ammo that you use in Mosins and SV-98s, and he doesn't miss. Not only that, Sturman has two bodyguards. Sometimes he can even have three in rare occasions, which will also be loaded out with other DMR style weapons that will equally kill you just as fast as Sturman will. Next up, we have Shoreline. Shoreline is a massive map, absolutely huge, but the main attraction of Shoreline is the health resort where all of the really good loot is. The other main attraction of Shoreline is its boss, Sanitar. Now, Sanitar is another boss similar to Sturman where he does have some bodyguards with him. Sanitar is a drug addict and a drug dealer and a drug manufacturer. Sanitar has the unique skill of when you shoot at him, he will run away to a room and he will inject himself with a bunch of different performance enhancers, not only making him tankier, but also faster. Sanitar is a psycho. You ever seen those videos of police shootings where somebody's on like PCP and like the cops try and taser him or like they shoot him like 30 times and he still keeps running at them? That's Sanitar. So have fun. Next up, we have Interchange, which is the Mall of Tarkov, which is actually pretty cool because it's based on a real mall in, I believe, St. Petersburg, where the Battlestate Games headquarters is, which is pretty sweet. Now, Interchange, classic mall. It's got tons of different stores, but it also has Killa, who is the Slav King, known <laughs> by most of the community as the King of the Slavs, I, I guess. Is that a slur? Can I say that? I think I can. I don't know. It's probably fine. Killa also happens to be the boss that wears this helmet, which is a very high level helmet. It provides a lot of protection and he is also also very, very hard to kill. He also wears one of the best body armors in the game, being his classic class five body armor that says Killa on it. I know, original. Killa is probably one of the hardest bosses in the entire game to kill. Reason being is because if he sees you, he will scream at you and then he will lay down suppressing fire with his RPK and he will generally destroy absolutely anybody who walks anywhere near him. Killa is notoriously difficult for newer players to kill for their quest where you're required to kill him and take his helmet out of raid. Stay away from Killa. He's a bad guy. Moving on from Interchange, we have, in my opinion, the absolutely worst map in the entire game being Lighthouse. I absolutely despise this map. I don't want to talk about it. But one cool thing about this map is it is the home of the goons. Now, the goons is a group of bosses. There's three bosses. They're very different. They're not like one boss and different guards. You've got Big Pipe, you have Bird Eye, and then you also have Knight. So all three of these different bosses have very different behaviors and they also have very different weapons. For example, Bird Eye doesn't make noise when he moves. So you have to be very careful when you run into them that he doesn't just run up on you and mag dump you. He's actually very, very scary. But the unique thing about the goons is not only can they be on Lighthouse, but they can also be on Customs and they can also be on Woods and they can also be on Shoreline. Being the only boss in the entire game outside of events within the game that can spawn on different maps in different locations. And then we have Reserve. <sighs> Again, I just don't want to talk about Reserve. It's another really bad map. I absolutely hate it. I don't know how anybody likes it, but Reserve is home to Glue Sniffer, otherwise known as Gluhar or Gluckhar, depending on how you want to say it. It's literally spelt differently on the wiki and in certain quest descriptions in the game. So I don't know what to call him but Gluhar is what I call him, or Glue Sniffer. So this is another very unique boss because he has the most guards out of any other boss in the entire game. He's scary because his AI works very differently to the other bosses. Some of his guards will set up a perimeter around him. Some of his guards will set up flanks around you. Other guards will push you. So not only do you have to worry about, you know, the guards holding the perimeter, but you also have to worry about guards pushing you and then the guards that are defending him. So it makes for some really intense firefights and an overall very rewarding boss to kill in the game. Moving on from that, we have one of the newest maps in the game, which is Streets of Tarkov, which just received another new expansion. It's actually very cool. There's lots of very nice things there, but on top of getting some new locations, it has also received a new boss. So Streets of Tarkov now has two bosses. You have Kaban, lovingly known as Kebab, and then you also have Kalan 
Kalante. So Kalante can spawn over at the shopping mall area on Streets of Tarkov, and he also spawns with an entourage. And then you also have Kaban, who can spawn in the car dealership area with guards, which will mount the mounted heavy machine guns and grenade launchers and absolutely decimate you if you don't know how to fight him. He is a very, very intense boss to fight, and his guards put up an equal challenge compared to the boss. So good luck with Kaban when you get that quest. Then you have Labs. Labs also does have a boss, which is very cool. Labs is a small underground laboratory where all these secret experiments take place, but the boss that you will run into on Labs are the people that can see you through walls. Labs is the most notoriously cheated on map in the entire game, and I tell most people just to never go there. And if you do have to go there, go to some dead server and cross your fingers that you don't run into, you know, Ni Hao 123 trying to loot the entire map and killing everybody in sight with one bullet. And then moving on to our final map, we have Ground Zero, which is supposed to be a map for a new players, so there are a bunch of introductory quests that you can do on that map to sort of teach you what you're going to be doing on the next maps when you move on from it. However, the only problem with Ground Zero is all the spawns are way too close together, so any new player that spawns in walks for 15 seconds and then gets immediately killed by somebody who's played the map before. So Ground Zero, cool conceptually, some pretty decent quests on there way too small for the amount of people that can be on it. Now that we've covered the general premise of the game and a lot of the things that you can expect to see when you do play the game, let's talk about the history a little bit. So Escape from Tarkov has had a very rocky development cycle. When you look at how the game's development started back in, you know, like 2017 when I started playing compared to how it is now, you'd be really amazed to see just how little has changed. It's it's really impressive. I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean that. <laughs> Some patches for sure definitely made the game a lot better, whilst a lot of other patches definitely garnered a lot of hate from the community, especially over on Reddit, YouTube comments, Twitter, Twitch streams, you name it. If a bad patch came out for the game, the community was all over it, and so are its creators. So with that being said, you will see a lot of heated discussions amongst community members of the game whenever updates come out, some good, some bad, but just remember at the end of the day that usually it's just all a bit of fun, it's all a bit of theory crafting, and for the most part, probably 99% of the people who do play the game love the game, and they just want to see it do well. So that's the story with Escape from Tarkov, a game that after 10,000 hours of playing, I'm still not sure whether I regret buying or not. It's much like an abusive relationship. Every time you load it up, beats the shit out of you, makes you sad, makes you depressed. But for some reason, we keep coming back. Thanks for watching. See you guys next time.